Let's face it, many of our elderly patients are on too many drugs. These drugs are potentially or actually causing them harms and the harms are greater than the benefits they're receiving and that's what we call polypharmacy, a topical subject in medicine and an important one to consider when we're looking after our elderly patients. Now a lot of what I have to say is going to be for prescribing physicians but I'm hoping that nurses and LPNs and RNs and family members and potentially some interested patients will gain insight and knowledge around what's really an important thing for their health and their well-being. I've learned over the number of years a number of strategies that I'm going to help you with today and, and some, some ways that I can view these topics with you that might be very useful for you going forward. But I thought the best way to do it might be to incorporate everything I can tell you into a story about a patient named Edna. Uh, a very exciting story because it has a really happy ending, although it didn't start out so well. So I met Edna about uh, a year ago when she was transferred to a local uh, long-term care facility from another city. Edna had been there for a couple of months after a fall, a fractured hip, and had been unable to get well enough to be living independently anymore. Her daughter Alice lived in the same town as me of Penticton, and we decided, uh, it had been decided that that she should be able to move to a facility here. So I was assigned to be her family doctor and uh, I received uh, a fax about the situation and I received a list of medications that Edna was on. And when I calculated how many pills she was taking a month and put a candy in the jar for that, this is how many pills she was taking a month. 896 pills, give or take, uh, laxatives and eye drops. Tremendous amount. Now I. I would normally in the past have been really discouraged by that, but now I'm kind of excited because I, I can be a detective, I can try to improve her health. And so I decided, okay, um, let's let it go for a few days, I'll fax it back to the pharmacist, and I'll see Edna next week, which I made arrangements to do. So when I went into the facility the next week, my goals were to really get to know Edna, to look at her functional problems, clarify what I could for diagnosis because there's a lot of uncertainty once you get into long-term care. A lot of information isn't very clear. So you have to act on what you can. You have to be a suspicious detective. And so I went to gather the information and assess the suspects, if you like, on the medication list. I started with reading the charts again and asking the staff about what they'd learned in the previous week, about what Edna was really facing in terms of her quality of life issues, her frailty and appetite and unsteadiness. And I looked at the medication list again and the diagnosis of the medical problems. So here's a list of her medical diagnosis on the slide. You can see it's not very extensive and it really doesn't make sense that Edna would be that bad for uh, someone who'd previously been well. The list, of, the list included dementia, which I didn't think was maybe most likely. I also compiled a list of her functional problems, which are here as well on this slide. And you can see it's quite long, and really these are the important things that matter to Edna day to day. This is what makes her life worth living or not living. She was suffering a lot with these symptoms. And you note on there that she, she indicated that she really was sick of being on all these pills. Um, I next then went to see Edna for my introductory physical examination, which, which is quite brief, it doesn't have to be very long, but I really wanted to focus on uh, how she was as a person. What was her mental state at this point? And um, she, looked, she looked a little vacant and slow. She was thin and uh, her general examination, her heart and lung examination was fine. She was very unsteady and so the neurologic exam kind of confirmed what I suspected. I went back to the uh, chart and talk to the care person that was there that day again and I looked up some collateral information and I found her, her daughter Alice uh, was in Penticton and so I, I thought I'd give her a call and I'm really glad I did because the collateral information I get from family is often hugely important and will make a major difference in how I approach a person because uh, so far I'd had a medication list, a problem list, and a medical diagnosis list, and I really didn't understand that much about Edna and what's happened to her. So Alice told me that there was a tremendous change in how her mother had been since she fell, broke her hip, and went to hospital. She'd gone from a fairly vibrant 85-year-old living independently with minimal help to someone who couldn't even 
get to the bathroom on her own. She was weak, had lost weight, and was confused and seemed to be foggy half the day, especially in the mornings. So Edna was, was, was a changed person, and Alice had been told that maybe Edna was in her last year of life, and this is all we could expect, and she was very discouraged, and she'd never been involved in any discussions about really what she or Edna wanted for themselves, and never had talked about medications, which I was now bringing up as a potential thing that we could offer uh, to reduce and improve Edna's quality of life. So by involving the family and Edna, um, they had finally felt that they were equal partners in this whole process, which is really essential when you're looking at deprescribing. So, so far, my detective work was paying off. I understood a lot more about Edna's care trajectory and illness trajectory. I had a clearer idea of medications and, and that there were probably some very inappropriate ones there. I had some understanding of the family's expectations and the support her daughter could provide me. And I had really seen a lot of dangerous combinations and drug issues in my brief review of the medication list. So I felt prepared that, that uh, I, would, I would be given some freedom to go ahead and I promised Alice I would get back and talk to her. So my next step was to, was to properly look at the medication list and I could see uh, on the list you've got before you that you can see uh, in those many drugs there are some high risk drugs. There's the ones that you can you can see that can cause bleeding, the anti-inflammatories, and she was on that. Uh, she was on aspirin as well. She was having pain, and there's medications there that can aggravate pain, such as statin drug. She was dizzy and lightheaded. She was on an antipsychotic, well known to do that. One of the critical drugs she was on was a drug with high anticholinergic side effects, and that was the ditropan for her overactive bladder. I found out she'd been on it for about four months prior to her fall, and that probably led to the cascade of events that caused her to go into the hospital. She was also on a diabetic medication, fortunately a safer one, but many of those, including insulin and blood sugar medications, have disastrous consequences in the elderly. She was also on an antipsychotic, started because in the hospital she was delirious for a few days, while it was continued, and that can potentially exacerbate all her problems, including her morning fogginess, her constipation, her unsteadiness, her falls. So I was making great gains in what I thought would be um, a number of medications. So these higher risk medications become more familiar to us as we deprescribe, and we look for them regularly. I could also see that Edna had these drug cascades uh, that we'll come to a little later, where a medication caused a side effect, which then a second medication was used to treat, causing a third side effect. And particularly around her constipation or her falling, you can see there's, there's uh, cascades. She had a stomach problem. Well, guess what? She was on an anti-inflammatory, so she was given a stomach pill, um, she, which could have caused another problem, and so on. So looking at the risks, the combinations was, was very fruitful. I focused first on trying to help Edna with her chief problems that I'd that had been raised when I met her. She wanted to be off pills if she could, and she was complaining a lot about the constipation and the dizziness. So I knew we could reduce the pills, but I looked for the dizziness and the constipation offending drugs first. And there were a number of them, including her bladder medications and others. So I, I thought about deprescribing those first. But the list was long, and I, and, I th and I realized that if there aren't any pressing problems, then we should look at ranking the rest in order to start deprescribing. Um, so Ian Scott from Australia has a good way to do this, and I follow him a lot on doing this because it gives me structure and order and gets me moving on the, on the changes. They're ranked from one to four. And if you look at Edna's list, um, this is how I, I would approach the ranking system. Number one are drugs that uh, are potentially harmful, um, of no benefit or contraindicated, um, and maybe part of a drug cascade. Uh, number two are those which are probably causing more harm than good at this time. Um, not always definite, and here's, here's the group that you really have to be a detective with, because harm is not always visible. It's like sailing the boat and not seeing the rocky shoal underneath. You've got to anticipate it. You've got to be suspicious. So number two is where you do a lot of your thinking. It's not that obvious. Um, 
could this be? Could it be the wrong dose? Could it be the wrong type of drug? Could it be a, a condition she doesn't have? Could it be um, that there's harm there that will happen if she gets some other drug or if she gets sick? What will happen? Number three, uh, in which to consider stopping or tapering, are the drugs which uh, are, were prescribed for a symptom or a disease that may no longer be active or needed. And Edna was on a on um, an antipsychotic for a brief period of delirium, which is common. And why was she still on it? Certainly, I had no doubt it was making her more uh, cognitively impaired and going to fall, and may have been misdiagnosed as dementia as a result. The final level of drugs, number four, are those which are used for prevention of disease outcomes. And in someone like Edna, uh, who's frail and potentially limited life expectancy, I'll often switch off those and go on to more symptom-related drugs to improve her quality of life presently, if I can find an individualized program that works for her. So here's a slide uh, that shows how I rank those drugs one to four. And you'll see I ranked a lot ones, some twos, threes, and some fours. Feel free to rank it as you want, and you may want to go back and look at the list and decide. It's really not that important how I rank them. Um, I chose to look at her main problems first to, in order to get some goodwill and help her out and, and make a difference. And then I focused on my longer term sequential changes that's part of a systematic deprescribing program. So once I'd done that, it was clear that I had lots to do and I, and I decided how I would go about that. And that's what's called a deprescribing plan. The actual process, the method uh, that includes close monitoring and follow up. And so I, I make notes, uh, usually they're not very long. I wanna make this efficient for myself and you need to as well to, to not spend a lot of time on a lot of these things. Uh, you get more efficient and you can, you can manage it well. And so I make a plan that includes the, 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 the levels at which I wanna change. Um, and I will start generally uh, one change at a time. I will sometimes change more than one drug. Um, I'm comfortable now that I can do that. Some of you may want to just change one, uh, but I will often do three or four drugs um, if I'm convinced that they're safe to do and important. And I don't waste a lot of time with slow reductions. I do 25 to 50% of most drugs every one to two weeks if I taper. Many I'll just stop. But, but beware again of the the critical drugs, the antipsychotics, the cardiac drugs, some of those drugs you need to taper a little more slowly, have appropriate monitoring. So we checked in his blood sugar, we checked her blood pressure, and we checked uh, mobility, and I had feedback on her eating and her walking. Guess what, it all improved. Her blood sugar stayed low. Not, not normal, but low enough for her. Her blood pressure rose from 110 uh, when she sat to 80 when she stood, to a, to a rock solid 150, which was no problem for her. So I got good results there. And guess what, she wasn't as dizzy. So with the sequential plan over about six weeks, following up with the staff, keeping, keeping instructions going, keeping conversations going, looking for surprises that fortunately didn't happen, uh, and keeping Alice surprised, who was now getting really excited because her mom was improving, she was blossoming, and Edna was much, much more excited. She was starting to walk without assistance using a walker down to, to have lunch where she really wanted to be now. So things were, things were improving, we're on a roll. Uh, sounds simple, but what I was doing is, is giving you an example that it was fairly straightforward, but I'll tell you some more things that might help you in general cases. The first one was that I had to recognize that there could be polypharmacy and that a medication review is needed. And that's the big issue for most of us. Recognizing that myself and my clinic patients now, or my hospital patients, I try to make it a number one priority. And I do that by writing polypharmacy on their problem list virtually always. And then I can go back and I can justify it and I deal with it. So that has to be recognized. It's easy when they come into long-term care. It's easy when Edna had 32 pills to take a day. But what are you looking for? You're looking for changes in conditions. You're looking for new problems or symptoms. It could somehow be drug related if you put on your detective hat and you think about it. I'm looking at someone who's increasingly frail. That alone is a big risk factor in a consideration for medication review. I'm looking at someone needs to move to a different care level like Edna did. I, I'm also looking at a big pile of pills. That's the obvious one, but, but not always uh, 
not always the, the best way to go about it. Certainly more pills is worse, and any kind of pill added to the pile can cause complications. But the big, answer, the big message is think about medication reviews, try to determine if inappropriate polypharmacy is there, and individualize your care. The second thing I wanted to highlight was that I've been doing this a long time, and I, I for, sometimes forget how, how much information I needed and how little I knew when I started. So I still have to remember that I use my resources on my pharmacist and I use online resources like medstopper.ca, deprescribing.org, and sharecarebc. And I did in this case too. I just asked the pharmacist about tapering something with Edna. It wasn't a big deal, but they're valuable, valuable resources and I never forget them. Uh, so when you're starting up, it's a, it's a big endeavor sometimes to, to know how to go. You're not alone. You can be the captain and steer the boat, have a good crew with you, um, and be smart about it, and you'll be much more successful. Finally, I wanted to give you a tip about what I think is the most important question that I ask myself whenever I look at a list of medications, big or small. And here's the big question. It is, given Edna in this case, in her condition, uh, with her goals of care, and with her preferences, would I, looking at this drug that she's already on, would I start this drug now? And you know, bingo. It's, it's a big question to, that, that takes all that you know, it, it synthesizes it, it, and I will often find maybe or no. And if I get maybe or no or an uncertainty, I probably need to seriously look at deprescribing that medication. And I think if you do that whenever you prescribe a medication for an elderly patient, and that's the other big message that we want to go today is that prescribing feeds the polypharmacy beast, right? And so if you prescribe more effectively, you will prescribe less or properly or at much lower doses. It's often very effective. You'll individualize your care and you will avoid a lot of the polypharmacy that now we're talking today about undoing. So that's another big benefit from this process. That you will be a better prescriber and therefore a better deprescriber. So here's the exciting part. Here's what Edna started with, number of pills per month. And after the prescribing process we've talked about, here is now Edna's monthly medication. It varies a little bit depending on whether her knees are a little sore one day. She's chosen to stay on the melatonin. She wants to take the vitamin D. And once a year, we give her an infusion for her bone strength because I think Edna's going to live at least another five years. And I'm willing to look at a more disease prevention model there with her. She, she, her symptoms really are so much better and her life has changed once again. And we sometimes reminisce because I see her in the community about how things have gone and her, her daughter Alice is of course overjoyed to have mom in her life again. So I wanted to go over a couple things that, that are also important and, and why sometimes this process is hard. Um, we all have a, an over acute sense of what medications are good for and how they benefit us, but we really are not as aware or knowledgeable about their benefits and harms. And patients are exactly the same. So doctors and physicians will often prescribe expecting benefits, underappreciating harms, and patients the same thing. And they will not complain. Uh, patients will not complain when they have a side effect. They don't always connect it, and we don't either. So we need to have those discussions when we deprescribe that put medications in the proper light of benefit versus harm, and we're willing to deprescribe, and we can be successful if we have the right conversations. So, so far I painted a pretty easy picture about deprescribing, and, and some of that's from my experience, but let's go over some of the things that don't always go as well, and I call them surprises. Now, if you're doing your communications correctly and you're uh, documenting uh, what you want to do and making a logical sequential s change in the medications, you should be okay. But sometimes something happens. Uh, you've tapered a medication for a symptom and the symptom gets a lot worse or the behavior changes or something like that. Um, surprises are good because they're learning experiences and, and you may have uncovered the fact that that person actually needs that medication. Maybe at a lower dose, so if you restart something, reconsider the starting doses, reconsider whether you've made a, the best dosing routine, or potentially there's another alternative, potentially a, a non-pharmacological alternative, such as when a behavior changes. Maybe, maybe something the staff could do that would help better than that antipsychotic drug. 
And when you're making these changes and you're trying to reach what you think is the best result, you can't always get there. So your goal may not be reachable at that time. Don't overstress about it. Um, don't work too hard on this. Be rational, be realistic, and you can always reattempt something again. Potentially, it wasn't the right time. But it's important to make this process uh, effective and efficient for yourself and your staff and your patients, of course. So as we come to the close, I, I, th I think about the movie as I referred to Edna's life and what might have changed if she'd had uh, active de-prescribers along the way. For example, when she was in the community and she was prescribed something for her bladder, in the ideal situation, someone would have recognized that she was already on a lot of medication, something had changed and therefore had uh, prompted a medication review and an assessment of polypharmacy. That might have changed her life dramatically. Uh, once she had broken her hip uh, and entered the hospital, deprescribing and polypharmacy assessment would have made a huge change again and she might have avoided delirium and complications and lost months of productive life. Um, and now that she's back in the community, are we going to keep paying attention to those things as she gets older, more frail, and she ages? Because you know, aging changes everything in pharmacy, in polypharmacy and medications, and we need to keep aware of that. So I think more uh, as I'm closing about the people in the community that aren't getting the care in this, in this aspect, that aren't being deprescribed correctly or having medications review, reviewed, and I hope that as, as you take away from this a renewed interest and motivation to do that, be aware of when, motiv when medication uh, reviews are indicated, uh, have a sense of what you can do about it and the support you can have, build some good habits, uh, see some really positive results like Edna. may not be as good as Edna, but it's definitely doable. And uh, I wish you best of luck and in, in continuing good experience in this.